just go over briefly. Uh, We're talking about recurrence frequency on uh, floods. Uh, this is my minor field advisor at Berkeley, Luna Leopold. He's kind of the, the uh, father of fluvial geomorphology. He, uh, back in the 1950s, uh, Luna led the team at the USGS, the Water Resources Division team, that discovered that river depth and velocity Increase, uh, increase as predictable rates as you go downstream. So what Leopold was really good at was taking a lot of data and plotting it and doing it over a long enough period of time over, and over enough different size watersheds that you could actually start to see um, patterns in it. And today, you know, he, he really disdained the modern... Um, academic model of publish or perish, because he said you have all these people going out and publishing things before they've studied them very long. And what they end up doing is just basically following their PhD research in some narrow field, and they just keep publishing, 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 and, um, and then later as they do more and more work, they start contradicting their earlier publishing. So your journals get clogged with a lot of useless stuff. Yeah. And that's unfortunately the world we live in, where quantity is more important than quality if you want to get um, promoted. And so it's very hard for young people like you to look out there and say, well, what in the literature here is of value to me as a practicing engineer? And what we're learning from practicing engineers is very little. The, the, the practicing engineers basically don't even crack the journals open. They don't even bother to look at them anymore because they become so clogged with a lot of minutia. So it's hard to find what's in there that's really of value. Leopold would study something for 10 or 20 or 30 years before he'd publish a word about it. And that really, unfortunately, we didn't, you know, our culture just doesn't um, allow for that anymore. So one of the things that he, he recognized here, look at this, he's, he's going across the board here, you know, looking at discharge and CFS from 1,000 to 10,000 you know, on up to 100,000 to a million CFS. And what you see is the data is lining up remarkably well over many orders of magnitude. This was a great, great um, revelation when he first suggested it in the late 1950s. Now, one of the things that is still a very contentious subject is about uh, levees and navigation on rivers. So we've, we've taken the modern floodplains and we've diked off 90% of them for agriculture because we got earth moving equipment that could do that starting around um, the time World War I ended in uh, 1918. And that was, a lot of that equipment came from the Panama Canal where they had been uh, built and developed for the Panama Canal. So what, what happens now is um, we actually see gauge height on the Mississippi River. When we look at the previous data from 1861 till 1927, we see a curve like this uh, relating stage height and discharge in Q, and then the cubic meters, uh, thousands of cubic meters per second. And after we've channelized it, and we've, we've gone from a channel that maybe have been um, 5,000 feet wide to a confined channel that's 3,000 feet wide after the Corps of Engineers start, took over the responsibility for building these kind of things in the 1928 Flood Control Act, then you start getting curves like this that are much higher. And this is very contentious. There's still a, a lot of um, people out there saying, no, 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 you know, you got it all wrong, this is not a problem. Um, but really, when we look at the, as I showed you before, when we just look at the number of breaks that we're getting and, and the height of the, of, the, uh, of the floods, we're seeing more and more damage more and more often. We really got to be taking a critical look at this and thinking about, you know, maybe, maybe we give back 20 percent 
25% of the floodplain for flood storage if we want to keep our urban, our densely populated urban areas uh, out of danger. So uh, Leopold uh, recognized that several generations ago, and it's, it's, it's going to probably come to the fore here in the not too distant future, I, I would imagine. So um, part four, let's see what I added there. Um, oh, on Nick points. Uh, oh, yeah, the siltation studies in Lake Mead. I forgot to show you these. So. Um, Lake Mead was really, really fascinating, and Luna was around when this work was going on in the late 30s and early through the 1940s. And uh, you can see here the Colorado River coming out of the lower granite gorge, right at the Grand Wash Cliffs. You had all this silty water coming into this nice, pristine, cool lake. And look at the subduction line right here. Just bam. In fact, that was a dangerous place to get your boat right in here because this denser fluid is coming in and being subducted under this cleaner, lighter fluid. And so if we go back and we look up in the Grand Canyon, here we are 20 miles back up the Grand Canyon, we have these fantastic silt beds that were deposited back in the late 30s, uh, early 40s, and then we had a big, big, um, another high water sequence didn't occur again until 1983. And that's when these beds were actually deposited. And then after the 83 high stand, what we see is, this picture's taken in 1984, it's the next year, and uh, you can see actually 85, it's taken two years later. And these things are already starting to be eaten down and taken out and redeposited. Now, this last decade at, at Lake Mead, we've seen the lowest uh, lake levels since Hoover Dam was completed 75 years ago. This actually shows how they were tracking the uh, advancement of the deltaic front into the reservoir as the reservoir was coming up, 1935, 36, 37, and then uh, right up here, 42 to 48, about where it was maintained. They actually brought it up to the maximum level for spillway tests between August and uh, November of 1941, and they brought it back down to this uh, position here. Now, the big surprise in all this were the density currents that subducted under the water up here and then flowed 116 torturous miles on a very low hydraulic gradient, oh, dead near zero, right to the dam face. And the dam had about 175 feet of sediment put into it the first decade which shocked the heck out of everybody. Every scientist was shocked. In fact, uh, I learned about this interviewing Vito Vanoni at uh, Caltech, who was uh, without uh, any peer. Uh, he was to channel hydraulics what Leopold was to fluvial geomorphology in the 20th century. And Vanoni was a really, really uh, bright star, lived to be in his 90s. And um, the way they found this was the concrete started heating up down here. They had put thermocouples all over this dam to measure the heat of hydration because without the cooling that they were doing on the dam, it would have taken 150 years to bring it down to the temperature. So they had all these cooling pipes. They had run all this cold water through it before they could keep adding the concrete on. And so they had all sorts of instrumentation on this dam. It was the first dam in the world built with a lot of instrumentation. And they were getting 70 degrees down here where they shouldn't be getting anything you know, over 50 degrees. And so they uh, did some soundings, and then they took some tests, and they pulled out this very, very organic sediment, which had a bacteria count about the same levels that you'd have on a municipal sewage treatment plant in a major American city. Shocked the heck out of everybody. They're going, oh, wait a minute, everybody just drinks out of the Colorado River. Well, you shouldn't be in the summertime. When you have warm water, Colorado River runs way above 70 degrees in the late summer in those days before they had dams and reservoirs on the river. And they had a lot of people die down at Ragtown in August 1931. People actually developed, um, they were pulling water out of the river and they were just letting the silt settle out of it. And they forgot about the bacteria you have in there when things are hot, things are warm. And they had a number of people die, mostly women and uh, female teenagers. So they shut the whole thing down and they, they ascribed it to... Um, to heat postration, but it was heat postration and um, 
gut problems with you know drinking bacteria, high bacteria levels in this water. So sedimentation studies that occurred at uh, Lake Mead and the turbidity currents that they discovered were incredible discoveries in, in the uh, mid part of the 20th century. And this actually shows uh, one of the papers that came out of Caltech with Vanoni students at that time. Well, you're way back here. You have this advancing delta upstream of the lake level. Remember, this is occurring upstream of the lake level. The lake has an impact upstream, many miles upstream. And you're having this heavy sediment get subducted right here and then flowing as a gravity turbidity channel deposit all the way through all these torturous bedrock canyons. And when it comes down to the dam, look what it does. Whoosh! Comes up. So they actually had a big pile of sediment against the dam and not nearly as much in Boulder Basin back here behind the dam. And the sediment piled up. And today it's about uh, 200 feet deep behind the dam itself. And so they actually did similar studies, American Geophysical Union and the USGS and the Bureau of Reclamation and TVA, Tennessee Valley Authority, started looking at Lake Mead, at Elephant Butte Dam on the um, Rio Grande River in New Mexico, and at Norris Dam on the uh, Tennessee River. And so those, those were the three projects they monitored throughout the 30s and 40s to look at this phenomenon of turbidity currents. Um, okay, I think that's, and this is the reservoir area capacity curves for uh, Hoover, for Lake Mead, as it was originally built. Originally built with nine and a half million acre feet of storage. That's ten times the size Lake of the Ozark. That's just the annual flood storage they built this thing with. It was colossal. Um, and then what the stage curve looks like today, they lost about three million acre feet. That was bigger than, that's the, in 30 years. That was larger than the largest reservoir in the world prior to the time Lake Mead was, uh, was filled in the late 1930s. So um, that figure just dropped to nothing after Glen Canyon Dam was completed in 1964, and they started storing water in it in March 1963. And so uh, today, they don't maintain anything close to 9.5 million. Uh, in fact, they don't even get over 4 million today on flood storage. Um, but they haven't had the reservoir full since 1984. And here's what the sediment looked like. Uh, about every 30 years, they go out and do side scan sonar on the reservoir floor. And if you take a digital elevation model, what you'll see is this is all deposition by turbidity current deposits. It just fills in the lowest areas just like soft plaster. <laughs> you could land a 747 on this surface. It is so perfectly flat. This is uh, Las Vegas Bay, Boulder Bay. Here's the dam way around over here in Black Canyon. Just fills it up flat as a pancake. So um, these were really uh, incredible revelations when they were first uh, being studied back in the 1950s. So I wanted to give you those little tidbits that I'd forgotten to tell you before. Let's see if there's anything else I changed. I don't think so. I think that was it. Okay. So we're going to go on to Chapter 9, which is land subsidence. And uh, the homework problems are not going to be uh, nearly as, as many to do. I think there's only a couple. We go to um, page th 385, 386. I think there's three, three problems. So I want you to do those three problems. Read the chapter and do those three problems. They'll be due next week. And I just want you to get a, uh, a, 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 an idea. When they talk about um, some of these concepts, I just want you to have a general idea. This, this is really stuff that is, is very, very important in the urbanized parts of the world. And it's out of control in some places, um, especially in the Asian continent and in uh, semi-arid areas. So we're going to talk about land subsidence and what that means. And there's a lot of things that cause land subsidence. This is Kilauea Iki Crater 
you know, on the big island of Hawaii. And this, this subsidence is due to the expulsion of magma from lower chambers. And so the, the caldera up in the, the crest of this volcano just, you know, is settling down. So there's a lot of different things that cause settlement. And um, groundwater withdrawal is the one we talk about the most uh, probably in school. And when we look at groundwater flow, oops, um, we have a capillary zone of aeration, which is above the permanent groundwater table. That's the zone of aeration. So up here, we have gas pockets. We have air voids. And down here, we have complete saturation. Now, when you get into fine-grained sediments, like along the Mississippi River floodplain, or the Nile River flood, any of the, any of the world's largest rivers. You have big, long miles of, of silt floodplain. You can actually get capillary rise in this zone 50 feet high. So that's, you've got to be real careful in there. The only reliable way I've ever found of really picking up the zone of saturation is with a cone penetrometer that actually has a temperature sensor. And when you go across this boundary, this one centimeter right here, you'll see a seven five to seven degree temperature change. But when you're in something like the Mississippi or the Nile, and you try to put in instrumentation, you're gonna to have to watch it for uh, six or 12 weeks and spend a lot of money compared to using the temperature device on the cone penetrometer. That's really the only reliable way when you have a high capillary fringe zone, which is typical on larger uh, rivers and streams. Okay. Um, where, how does the water actually flow through the ground? Well, it flows on a very tortuous path, like you see here, scribed in the red line. And how do we approximate that in engineering calculations? We use straight line approximations and assume linear flow. It's just easier mathematically. We can't handle this kind of nonlinearity mathematically. Uh, it'd be very, co very costly to, to model this. And so what we do is we go out and we put uh, wells in the ground over here and over here and over there and then we use the fudge factors based on the observations in those wells to run our groundwater models. So our groundwater models like our slope stability models are not accurate from a scientific point of view. <laughs> They're tweaked to work from an engineering point of view. They get to the right answer for the wrong reasons because it's mathematically too rigorous to get there using the right reasons. So you, you know, a lot of people in your generation, I feel sorry for you because you're going to be using these you know, $50,000 computer programs and you're just going to believe them because you paid so damn much money for them. And the sad part is they are going to fail you as often as they uh, help you. And that's where you need to have the old gray hair of experience looking at it and saying, that number doesn't look right. And the big problem we have is heterogeneity. We have heterogeneity. We have places where we're going to get uh, different answers for different reasons, which takes me back. Hang on a second. <laughs> uh, there's a slide I wanted to show you in fluvial processes, which I didn't get to. Uh, let's see. Uh, huh. Hmm. Well, it's let me down here. I don't see it. I just changed it today, so it should say modified today. But I don't see one that says modified today other than the two I showed you. That isn't it. Uh, let me look. Yeah, part nine. Let's see. Now it's where we talk about uh, point bar deposits. Huh. Now that's mystifying. Ah, I put that in there. Hmm. Hang on a second. I really want to show you this. It's, a, it's an important slide. Hmm. 
That's not it. You can sort the five by eighteen five. What? Sort the five by. Well, I mean by date. Well, yeah, but it's, uh, what I'm not finding is today's date, which there should be one there. One of these that should have today's date on it. I'm not seeing it because I just changed it in the last hour and added it in. All right, well, shoot. Yeah, this is where I put it in, right here. It's not there. All right, something went wrong. Hmm, I don't know what. That's where I inserted it, right there, well, right there, actually, between 10 and 11. All right. Wow. I don't know how that happened. All right, well, we'll continue on with this. I'm sorry. Um, all right, so water table is the, uh, by definition, is the upper limit of the zone of saturation. And where you have variations in the water table, you can have bad things happen. And um, the shape of the water table is usually a subdued replica of the surface topography. And uh, so the better model you have of surface topography, the better idea you're going to have of the water table. So one of the big things we get into are drought impacts. When we have um, a large volcanic eruption like we saw this past week in Indonesia, that causes changes in weather patterns. And it creates wetter weather in some parts of the globe because of the... Uh, the expulsion of sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere, which collects as sulfur dioxide aerosol at the troposphere-stratosphere boundary, and it reflects the sun's energy and lowers sea surface temperatures. So that can cause greater rainstorms, an El Nino effect, on the Western Hemisphere, in South America and North America, and it can create um, in other parts of Africa and uh, the Indian Ocean Basin, it can create periods of dryness, of extended drought. And so when you have precipitation deficiencies and you go into droughts, this is where you start having a chain reaction or a domino effect that really uh, exacerbates ground settlement. So as you already had people overdrafting groundwater and now you add on dry weather, and you exacerbate the problem. So um, variations in groundwater are very hard to really appreciate because the examples we give you in school tend to be overly simplified. You can actually have groundwater piling up uh, in the ground with big changes over short distances if you have something of lower permeability in there. So if you don't have just a nice layer cake geology, which you're not going to have in places that are tectonically active and actively depositing, that was the slides I wanted to show you, you can actually have these groundwater mounds that locally uh, influence things. So if we look at the, the basic types of gaining and losing streams, uh, we, we're in the something... Uh, like this where we actually have a lot of water in a tropical area and it's coming down and it's basically coming up and feeding our stream, we call that a gaining stream. And uh, if we're in an area where the water is uh, flowing down this river, this would be like California, uh, we have a losing stream. We actually have bank losses in these areas. This would be areas that get less than 20 inches of rainfall a year. This would be areas that get more than 20 inches annual rainfall per year, typically. So you have your calc alkali soils here, you, and you have your humid, semi-humid conditions up here. And then we have Missouri, the Ozarks, which is a karst system. Karst system, you have to throw out everything, and it's much more complex because you have uh, channels that only occasionally may have water in them, that are then feeding down into a water table. But that water table is very, very stable. You can come in here and pump and pump and pump and pump. You can pump till um, you know you have a libertarian president, and you're still not going to change the groundwater level a whole lot. Okay. So uh, interaction between the groundwater and the streams is something then you have to understand 
when you're putting your model together. You know, do I have a gaining stream environment? Do I have a losing stream? Or do I have a combination of the first two? Well, you can actually get combinations. This is one of the problems they have over in Tennessee. They have a big, well-developed karstic network, but they have these huge, ancient river networks as well. And they actually end up having a combination problem. And of course, the computer programs aren't written for combinations. That's too big of a PhD. They're written for, you know, one of these type of thing. And so sometimes you can get in where the situation changes and you go from a losing stream to a gaining stream because you had enough years of wet weather. Well, here's the theoretical movement of groundwater. And this has been proven out with isotope studies. Isotopes of water, deuterium oxide is one of them. And, uh, and you can actually go in here and take water samples at depth and get some idea of the age of this water this water and that water. And what you find out is um, you got this water way back here. It doesn't travel in a straight line down to here. It actually takes the great circle route. It goes way down here and then comes back up here. So this takes a much longer travel path than the stuff right here. So they're not moving linearly. With groundwater, the first thing you got to do is get linear out of your brain and realize that everything is curvilinear. Go by a French curve, uh, look at curvy figures, uh, get yourself out of the straight edge environment, okay? Because there ain't no straight edges in geology. That's why males are attracted to it so much, maybe. I don't know. Um, storage and movement of groundwater. Well, the percentage of the total volume of the rock or sediment that consists of pore spaces uh, is the porosity. Now, a hundred years ago, there were a whole bunch of lofty papers written by a whole bunch of engineers with lots of college degrees called hydrologists, the early hydrologists. William Mulholland of Los Angeles is one of the most prominent. And he says, you know, we don't have to ever build a dam in Southern California. We have so much groundwater stored out here in these porous gravels of the San Fernando Valley and the San Gabriel Valley. All we got to do is drill a hole and put a straw in and suck the water out and we can support 15 million people. Well, that's, that was the theory, because theoretically, the water is there. But it turned out when you put the straw in, you couldn't suck hard enough to overcome capillary attraction that's down there. So we have something called specific yield. Specific yield is the actual amount of water you can get out of the ground by just doing something like pumping under one or two, three atmospheres, something low. So it turned out it wasn't nearly as easy as everybody thought. And in fact, L.A. can't support more than a quarter million people with the natural water resources they have. They have 17 million there right now. So the only way they do that is they go hundreds and hundreds of miles away and they bring down aqueducts, one from the Feather River, one from the Owens River, and one from the Colorado River. And that's how they're able to support so many people there. Denver has the same problem. They have to go to the west side of the Continental Divide to get their water. So some of the things we look at are permeability, which is hydraulic conductivity with respect to water. We're, not, we're just talking about water. We're not talking about oil here. And then we look at aquitards and aquifers. Now, permeability is the, material, is the ability to transmit the fluid. You know, how many... Um, centimeters per second does this fluid move under a given head. Now that's a real dangerous number that gets misused because people forget that when you go to the laboratory and you run the ASTM tests in your, in your geotechnical laboratory, you're only running the test for one to two PSI head difference. You go out to Hoover Dam, you got 500 PSI. You don't have one or two. You have a whole lot more than that. And you can actually force a lot of water through a very tight crack under 500 PSI, which you can't do in the lab under 1 or 2 PSI. Aquitards are relatively impermeable layers that hinder or prevent water movement, such as clay. Clay is going to come up over and over and over again if you're going to have a career as a geological or geotechnical engineer. Clay controls everything. Whether you have clay or don't have clay makes a whole lot of difference. 
Aquifers are the permeable strata that everybody wants to have on their ranch because when you put a hole into an aquifer, you can get all the water out you want, or so you think. So sands and gravels make great aquifers, but they're generally laterally restricted. What does laterally restricted mean, Dr. Rogers? That means if it's on your property, it's probably not on that one over there or that one over there. That's what it means, laterally restricted. So sometimes you can go into a gravel and get all kinds of water. I had lots of them in California. I started out at two or three 150 gallons per minute. And a week later, I was getting 20. And three months later, I was getting six because it's laterally restricted. There's only so much water in there. And so uh, sometimes you're, you know, in California, man, you're lucky to find a well with uh, three gallons per minute sustained. Now, that'd be laughable around here in the Ozarks. In the Ozarks, you put as big a straw in as you want and gulp away because you got karst around here. That's why we have so many mosquitoes, too. All right, so movement of groundwater. One of the things we have to appreciate about it is it is exceedingly slow. Very, very slow, unless you're in karst. Around here we have karst, we go fast. We go a mile in a week around here. No problem. In fact, we can go six miles in 13 days around here. Um, energy for the movement is provided by gravity. So you have to have a higher zone flowing towards a lower zone. And Darcy's Law, which has been around 200 years now, Henry Darcy was a, an engineer, civil engineer, in Lyon, France, trying to get their municipal water system working in the early 1800s. And Darcy, you know, Q equals KIA, he said, the permeability remains uniform, the groundwater velocity increases as the slope of the water table increases. And so that's a pretty fundamental theorem to keep in the back of your mind all the time. And it's a two-dimensional theorem, but it really works well under controlled situations. And of course, Darcy intended it for pipes. He didn't intend it for you know, looking at groundwater modeling, although we use it for ground. It's very useful for groundwater modeling. Um, Darcy's law basically recognized a hydraulic gradient. The hydraulic gradient is the water table slope, S. So the water table, the water table has a slope to it that provides energy head that pushes the water. Now, when you get into clay, you need a really steep hydraulic gradient because you're trying to push through something that's impermeable. So when you put in dewatering wells on a clay site, yikes. That's really testy. You know, how far apart do we put the wells? 20 feet, 10 feet, 5 feet, 2 and a half feet? Depends. Depends how much you want to settle the buildings around you. And this is one that I've, um, that's really uh, problematic. You have to learn this in the place where you're working. If you're working in Shanghai or Taipei or wherever it is, you've got to figure out that this is really dangerous. If you get into a channel and start withdrawing a lot of water, you can settle everybody's building who's built along that channel up gradient of your site. So you really got to make yourself an underground map of all the channels and figure out what their relative permeability is. This stuff is really dicey because when you're talking groundwater flow, things change in a short distance by orders of magnitude. Six orders of magnitude is not uncommon or impossible. Six orders of magnitude, yeah, from clay to gravel. Six orders of magnitude, can be nine even. So this drives people nuts in places like dams where you start grouting and you find you have this, you know, nine orders of magnitude difference in permeability for your grout penetration. Yikes. Um, hydraulic head. Hydraulic head's the vertical difference between the recharge and the discharge points. Now that's the one that can get us into a lot of trouble as well if it changes. If you put in Lake Mead, put this big reservoir in there, or Lake Powell, you're going to change the groundwater regimen for that whole drainage around that reservoir. Because you've got 500 feet of water, you know, running over a huge 100-mile area, you're going to change things. So, here's the basic premise we're just talking about. We look in the ground here, we say there's the groundwater table under the ridge. The groundwater table tends to mimic the topography. See that mimicking? And you see this thing pinching out down here? And so here we're in a nice uh, humid environment 
with uh, more than 20 inches of rain a year. Uh, we have a gaining stream. And we're looking at here, we're looking at a, a well located here and a well located there. And we're saying there's the change in head between this location and that location. And we're using a D that is what? Straight line approximation. Wrong, 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 wrong. But that's what we're going to use. Remember that in your PhD orals if you get hydrologists in there. You might ask you that question. Okay, we use that straight line D, but that's not what it looks like. What does it do from back here? That's how it moves. Anyway, this is how we approximate it. That's the difference between a scientist and an engineer. The scientist wants to know what's actually going on, and an engineer says, I don't care what's actually going on. Just give me the number, and I'll give you the answer. I solve problems. I don't study things. Okay? I'm bipolar. I have both those in me. Sometimes I'm real curious. I want to know. And other days I said, no, I want to go home tonight. I'll give you your answer. Get the hell out of here. Okay? So here, that's an approximation. But it works. Hydraulic gradient I is the change in head over the flow distance D. And it's a straight line approximation. So realize you're going to be, you're going to guess wrong 99% of the time. You're going to be too high or you're going to be too low. I just want you to be aware of that so you don't bet too much money on this stuff and lose your shorts, okay? You want to keep your shorts on. All right. Storage and movement of groundwater. How do we actually trace this kind of stuff? Well, a, a lot of things we can do with fluorescent dyes. And we use fluorescein dyes all over Missouri. And we get a lot of, we, every time we use them, we're going to get some surprises. We, we put some fluorescein dye in here, and the water, instead of staying in the natural watershed, which we see on the topographic map, that water sometimes goes over here into the next county, into a different watershed. Welcome to Karst. Karst, you never know what you're going to get. It's like going on a blind date with one of those computer dating services, and the picture has been touched up, and she's gained 80, 80 pounds since her picture was taken, okay? So that's what Karst is like. Karst is the big kahuna mama. You've got to watch out. Uh, carbon-14 to date. The water's last exposure to the atmosphere. Um, that's these isotopes I was talking about. And we get into those kind of things when we get into testy situations like Superfund sites, where we really want to know, hey, do we have to worry about this bad stuff, these dense, non-aqueous phase liquids, Dean apples, uh, going over here and uh, polluting the groundwater? I don't think so. You know, I've got, I got an aquitar down there, and it's a shale, blah, 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 blah. Well, the way we tell is we go out and we do isotope tests to see how old the water is that's protected by that aquitard. So Darcy's law, developed for pipe flow, Q, quantity of water, equals the coefficient of permeability times the cross-sectional area of flow times the hydraulic gradient. And the hydraulic gradient, I, is change in head divided by the flow length. And Darcy found this empirically, and it works great for pipes. That's why you have to have so many storage tanks around a town. The farther away you get from the reservoir, the more head loss you have with the increased flow in the pipe, pipe friction. And so you look around Rolla, we have these big tanks around the town, strategically on top of the tall hills. You don't put the water tanks in the bottom of the valleys. All right, inner flow. We've talked about inner flow before. Inner flow are the springs. This is the wild card. It's the wild card. Now, in karst areas like uh, the Ozarks, the inner flow numbers are very, very respectable. They're huge, and they're very, very constant. They're pretty reliable. You get to other places, like out west of the 100th meridian, and spring flow is anything but constant. It's going to be different every damn day of the year, every year. That's what spring flow is like when you go out to New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada, or California. You're never going to see much repeatability because you always have different antecedent flow conditions in terms of precipitation. So it's the natural outflow of groundwater that occurs, and it can be caused by aquitards, creating localized zones of saturation. When you get out west, most of the time, spring flow or inner flow is controlled by fault zones. Fault zones have fault gouge. Fault gouge is made out of clay. Clay under high cataclastic shearing can have a permeability 10 to the minus 9 centimeters per second. So it's very, very effective aquitard. All right. Well, here's an aquitard. It's a simple one. This is a shale bed. 
like an old uh, lake bed or something. It's buried in the geologic unit here. So you have rain or per water that percolates down, hits the aquitard, and gets perched on it. Well, most, most shale units are aquitards. And you have a semi-confined aquifer condition here above it. And so that can be great because you can get little springs along here on top of the shale. And that's very, very common. Where you have springs, you usually have landslides later, sooner or later, down here beneath them. And then you have a main water table that's down here at some depth that's not being influenced by the perched water table. So that's actually pretty common in the Ozarks. We have lots of aquitards here. And uh, some of them are dolomites, some of them are quartzites, some of them are shale uh, beds. There's some Pennsylvanian shales that, that, that make really nice aquitards over in the St. Louis metro area. Uh, springs and karst. Uh, some of my favorite stories, this is Vasey's Paradise, uh, River Mile 31 in, um, in uh, Marble Canyon, going down to the Grand Canyon. Uh, this was named after John Wesley Powell named this in, 1960, in 1869 after a botanist that he had worked with, Vasey, on some of his previous trips. And notice you actually have three, three outlets. You have the main outlet here, you have an auxiliary one here, and then you have a high one here, and the high one only runs when there's a flash flood condition underneath this. And a young spelunker uh, named Peter Huntoon, picture of him here, 1966, he did his uh, PhD in hydrogeology, one of the earliest PhDs in hydrogeology, in the karst of the Grand Canyon. He loved to go into the canyon and go climbing up into these caverns like Vasey's Paradise, and he'd go back in these things for miles and map them. And he, and he produced those in his Ph.D. thesis, which came out University of Arizona in 1969. And if you're a, a Grand Canyon uh, bibliophile like me, I started working there um, the generation after him. So I, I started working, this is 1978, my first trip down the river. We, we took his thesis drawings, and then we would go in these caverns and go way back in them. And, of course, the big question he was trying to solve was, where does all that water go that rains on the Kaibab Plateau? because it doesn't appear to come into the Colorado River. If you look at all the springs along the Colorado River, they should have a lot more water coming off the north. And so Huntoon set about trying to solve that dilemma by going inside these caverns at the major underground rivers and putting in weirs and measuring them and trying to figure out what the lag time was between the precipitation events way up on the plateau, a mile above him, and where that water came out. And he was actually in Vasey's Paradise in 1966 when they had a major event. And it occurred exactly 48 hours after the storm above. And he and his buddy in there uh, came within an eyelash of getting killed. They actually were, um, they could hear the flash flood coming in the cavern because sound is ducted down there. So they turn, just like a Steven Spielberg horror movie, and go, Oh my gosh, we better get the heck out of here! And they start running to try and get out of there. They got their, their uh, little light on their head and everything, like you see right here. And they run and they run, and the, and the flood gets them. They can't outrun the flood. It gets them, and they, they feel like we're, we're toast. Too bad we didn't bring jelly with us today and put it in our pockets, because you know, we, we are going to get cooked here. And... Uh, See, someone's catching the jokes. And, uh, and so they got caught up in this thing, and they got spit out out of the high hole. And you know, what happened to them when they fell here 60 feet? Well, you know, broke some limbs. You know, that's what happens here. They're lucky to be alive and tell the story. So broke several bones. They got out of there, and they got deposited down here on this fan. And, but they lived to tell the story about it. So you want to read an exciting Ph.D. thesis, that's the only one I ever know that didn't put me to sleep. I, in fact, I, I stayed up all night long reading it because it was just so good. You know, you're going, whoa, baby, whoa, man, look at that. Oh, no, man, I can't hardly believe this. Anyway, it was, it was, it was better than any of the, uh, the, the, the sites that some of you guys spend all your time on. Um, hot springs and geysers. Uh, these don't get into our consciousness that much, but they're a huge engineering problem because uh, you have to look at the solubility coefficients and you have this all sorts of exotic salts, especially potassium salts and phosphorus and uh, iron and things that really uh, create havoc with engineered structures in terms of uh, 
causing deterioration, rapid deterioration of things like reinforcing steel. This is out at, um, of course, at, at, at Yellowstone National Park, which is, this is a colossal size national park. It's like its own state. It's so big. It takes you a long time to see it. And they have these hot springs all over the place because that's a, a place where we have three major suture zones in the North American craton that intersect. It's a hot spot. And that hot spot has been responsible for all of the um, Snake River Plain volcanics going back to the early Miocene. So that has gone from Malheur County, Oregon, all the way across uh, Idaho and turned up and is now in the northwest corner of, um, of, of uh, Wyoming. And they have major eruption sequences about every 50,000 years off that zone. And, of course, the last one was about 50,000 years ago. So. I don't know if you want to buy real estate in that area. But anyway, we have meth labs around here. So anywhere you go, you're going to have your, your hazards. Um, the geysers are intermittent hot springs, which erupt. And, of course, when these things erupt, what it's testifying to are big changes in effective stress down here and the fact that you have a buildup of heat and that water expands and it has to vent itself out. If this was something... You had to deal with, of course, uh, there's all kinds of things you could do to tap into this thing and to vent it out and run a geothermal plant with it. That's come a long way. Um, here's how it works. You get superheated water down here because of the hot crust. Maybe the crust is thinner in this area. There's fracture systems. And so this thing heats up, and then it periodically vents out. What they're doing now on some of these sites is they're actually injecting water over here on one side of it, letting it go across the chamber, get superheated up, and withdrawing it over here, maybe a mile away. And that's become one of the preeminent ways of doing geothermal. Geothermal, very, very um, uh, 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 debatable and testy. One of the things, if you don't take this water that you take out, and put it back in the ground, you're going to cause settlement if you have unconsolidated settlement, unconsolidated sediments. And that's what happens in uh, Baja, California. The Mexican uh, government has two geothermal plants near Cerro Preto in the uh, Colorado River Delta. They just take the water out and let it evaporate in these large ponds. They don't bother to re-inject it. So they're getting colossal levels of settlement, three meters of settlement since the plant opened in 1973. That's over 10 feet of vertical settlement. And uh, they run Toshiba turb turbines on it. Uh, in the United States, you can't do that. If you do geothermal power here, you have to re-inject an equal amount of water that e balances the amount you're taking out because of the ground settlement implications, which we're going to be talking about. All right, if we look at the distribution of hot springs in the United States, the big red spot, that be Yellowstone right there, see the big red spot, and then all these others are associated with faulting and late tertiary quaternary volcanics. So there's lots of hot spots to pick from. We even have Hot Springs, Arkansas, which the mafia loves down here, and any other people like it too, churches, Baptists, everybody. Um, you can always tell if it's a mafia person, they're drinking. If it's a Baptist person, they're reading the Bible. But anyway, they all go to the same places down here. Uh, neat tourist destination. You notice we don't have any tourist destinations in Missouri. That's why it's good for you to go to school here. You don't have the distractions. You have other places. Um, got a few of them up here between, on the border between Virginia and West Virginia as well, which haven't really been tapped much. Um, Chemical sedimentary rocks accumulate where you have uh, geysers. This is, uh, again, some of my work in the Grand Canyon way back when. We have these travertine-rich waters. This is the Little Colorado River. This is Havasu Creek. Havasu Creek actually has a drainage area of 4,000 square miles. So small wonder they have some water coming down. And this is actually the, uh, the bathtub rings at Lake Mead. And those are in Black Canyon right there. There's a picture I took in junior high school, actually, uh, right from the dam on the Arizona abutments. These are actually deposited just during that three-month period when the water was high in 1941. So it doesn't take long for carbonate to get deposited. Now, water wells. You go out and look at water wells. Uh, water wells go back as far as we can go. In fact, we look at the earliest Roman engineering. It's all about digging wells not about building bridges. 
Why, why would digging wells be so important to the Romans and so important to the Americans when we went into the Middle East in 1990 for the Gulf, Gulf War number one? Well, how long are soldiers going to last without water? Not long, yeah. I guess you can call Culligan Man to come out and give you the water. And so early Roman officers were taught the rudiments of geology and engineering. Military engineering preceded civil engineering by several thousand years. And the whole purpose was to learn how to excavate wells. Because wells in the Middle East are what made land valuable, just like they are in Southern California. Price of land in California is directly related to whether you got water or don't have water. Same thing in Arizona, New Mexico, Nevada, anywhere you go, west of the 100th meridian, the value of the land depends on water. So when you're driving along Interstate 40 and you're uh, out near Grand Canyon, you see these, these, these big roadside signs say, you can buy a 40-acre ranch for $20,000. Now, somebody's from L.A., they go, 40 acres, I could be a land baron. Yeah, because California, you're lucky to buy a quarter acre. The problem is no water. You got to bring your own water. You want to drill a hole in that part of the world, south rim of the Grand Canyon, you got to drill about one mile deep to get any water. A mile deep. See what's nice about the Ozarks? Don't have to drill as deep around here. Lots of water. All right. But we have to be careful. If we just go out here willy-nilly and drill, and we're not in a karst area, we're outside Missouri, we're over in Kansas maybe, this is what can happen. We can actually get a Kona depression off this well depending on several things, how permeable this is and how much recharge and how much Q we're sucking out of this thing. Now, if you get it down anything like this, you're dead. That's a dead well. I mean, you always want this thing going about 33% deeper than the deepest point of your drawdown because you've got sediment collecting in the base of this thing, and you don't want to put your pump down in the base of your well casing anyway. So this is, an, this is a cartoon case. I mean, if you, if you had anything like this, you're, you're dead at this point. You're calling the driller and saying, drill me a new well. And... Uh, so here's, you know, this well's gone dry, this well's gone dry because this guy overdrilled the aquifer. And these kinds of things actually did happen all over eastern Colorado and western um, Kansas and all across Nebraska back in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. They overdrafted the Ogallala sandstone aquifer. Artesian wells were really... Uh, uh, explored by the Italians. In Italian, the Romans started building um, a very sophisticated system of water supply for Rome. And uh, when they did that off the Rubicon uh, River and off the, uh, they had these uh, aquifers they would tap into, they found out pretty quickly that the highest they could get the, the, the fountains to go would be 33 feet, which is one atmosphere. And so they figured out that you had this artesian condition and that the more you tapped into it, the lower the fountain would go. And so that was the first discovery, just like with the, their work on uh, volcanism with, uh, uh, down at Pompeii and Herculaneum. They figured out that there were different types of artesian wells that were non-flowing and flowing and that they're both valuable to you. Of course, non-flowing, you're not going to get the, the fountain going. But this became a really big deal that everybody else emulated all across Europe. So as Europe got populated, uh, the towns tended to be founded around places where you had artesian wells and you had a public source of water that was reliable, that everybody could get to and go down and fill up their uh, water conveyance jars or whatever they had. Now... Uh, in North America, we usually show this particular picture, and this is the, you know, the Rocky Mountain area uplift, and then we have these confined aquifers like the Ogallala that come way out here and, and go out for hundreds of miles uh, out in the prairies. And when they started developing drilling technology in the late 18th century, the 1890s, and electrical pumps came on beginning around 1892, 1893, now you could go out here and drill, and the water would just come right up because it was artesian. 
So that's how they were able to settle so much of um, western Kansas and eastern Nebraska. Now, as they kept going and started overdrafting it, they had to start putting pumps in. So in the 1930s, the drilling technology got better, but you had to put in, you had to get electricity or make electricity with a windmill or something and then put a pump in in order to get the water out. Now, the windmill, uh, just using pure windmill energy, that goes back much further. That goes back... Uh, in fact, a Union Pacific had one well 1,000 feet deep in western, in uh, central um, Wyoming where they actually went down and, and used the, had the world's largest windmill to try and get the power to pull it up that far. But what happened here is they, they basically started overdrafting it, and so you saw them lose the hydraulic head. The hydraulic head eventually got diminished, and they had to start managing all the water and the states got into the water management business and usually the states contract with the uh, USGS Water Resources Division to help them manage. So that's really the USGS you know, has two huge roles. One, mapping the country, building, making the maps, and two is actually the management of the groundwater resources. That's really where they've had this, you know, huge tentacles that go out all over the place that most of us don't think about. It's not like they go out and find gold mines and stuff like that and, and do the, the hazard stuff that we see them in the news doing. Now, the water stuff is, you know, 24-7. It has to be managed very carefully or people are going to go thirsty. So here's the Ogallala sandstone. Um, goes from uh, central Texas all the way up into southeastern Wyoming, all the way across Nebraska. I mean, basically all of Nebraska has the Ogallala underneath it. You can see here uh, western Kansas, the western panhandle of uh, Oklahoma, and the panhandle area of uh, even down to the Permian Basin and up here into northern Texas. So they started drilling it from the mid-1890s on, and by the 1930s, the formation had lost its artesian head due to overdrafting. And that was a very dry period. It's called the Dust Bowl period in Oklahoma because they were doing dry farming. And the only way you could have wet farming out here was to poke holes into the sandstone and pump the water out. Um, artificial systems are what we use. Like, uh, this is similar to the kind of system that, uh, that we actually saw develop in Lyon, France in the early 1800s by Darcy. Well, he put the tank up on the hillside, on the mountainside. We, when we're out in some place that's flat, like uh, Kansas, we actually put the water up into a storage tank, and the idea here is to get enough pressure head that we can drive that water through a pipe conveyance system out so far. And uh, typically, we uh, operate at heads between 120 psi and 20 psi. 60 is a pretty average number for a municipal system. And I had a house in California for 25 years where I was right on the distal margin. The guys across the street had a different water company coming from Oakland, and my water company came from, uh, from uh, Concord, Martinez, Pacheco, and uh, I had barely 22 psi head. That was on the best day. So it was very, very low. didn't have much pressure on my hoses or anything. Now, you get over to Hawaii. I had clients over there because they had a lot more hills where they were having bursts in their water lines because they were operating around 126 to 140. That's really at the upper end of a municipal supply system. 140, you're going to start breaking a lot of, especially plastic valves and things because plastic valves are subject to creep. Um, what are some of the problems now? Where all this is going is now. We finally got there. I don't know, slide 25 or something. You know, what are the problems associated with groundwater withdrawal? Well, there are many. There's all kinds of them. Yeah. You can't treat groundwater as a non-renewable resource. If you just start withdrawing it, withdrawing it, withdrawing it, and not managing it, you're going to pay a huge price for doing that. And you have a subsidence problem because of change in effective stress. When I put something underwater, especially a long way underwater, the water is incompressible. It's got a Poisson ratio of 0.5. Put 10 pounds of load on water, five goes this way, five goes that way. It, it, it holds load. It doesn't affect bearing capacity. It helps bearing capacity. 
So a high groundwater table, the only reason we avoid that with buildings is we don't want to get dry rot. But if we keep the groundwater down a meter, we're going to be fine. We're not going to get dry rot, usually. So the problem here is when you pump the water from wells faster than it recharges, you get a net drawdown of the water table. That's going to increase the effective stress. And now that clay that's down there is going to consolidate under the increased dead load that it feels because the water table is going down. And you get some alarming levels of settlement. We're going to talk about that. So if you look at something like this, this is the Santa Clara Valley, Silicon Valley, where San Jose, Santa Clara are, and the south end of the uh, San Francisco Bay. And if we look in that area, we have these clay layers here. These are old lake sediments, because we have a very flat gradient, and sea level basically used to be down here. And as sea level came up over the last 11,000 years, you had all this basin filled in with sediment, 500 feet deep filled in very, very rapidly, you know, geologically speaking. So now you have these clay lenses here, which um, are really problematic because if you start drawing the water table down dramatically, which they did from 1890 to 1933, uh, these compressible units settle. And they settle a lot, a few inches to a few feet. And so if we actually look at that, we can see this when we fly around places like western Kansas, western Missouri, um, all over Kansas, eastern uh, Colorado. You see these well points where they're withdrawing out of some aquifer, and then that's running a circular sprinkler system off that point. So that allows us to grow crops we otherwise wouldn't be able to do easily, uh, but we have to um, manage that groundwater resource. If we overdraft on it, then it's just going to get more and more expensive every year. And also, when you're in an alkali-type soil, you have to keep flushing. You're actually, the, every time you have an agricultural crop and the, the, um, the water's getting transpired out by the crop, the, the salt that's in that water, if there's any kind of dissolved salt, TDS, total dissolved solids, it's going to precipitate out and you're changing the soil chemistry every year you're there. So one of the great, um, you know, one of the big lies I was always told in school was, you know, uh, Los Angeles were mean bastards because they went up to the, uh, the Owens Valley and they stole the farmer's water. My, 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 my kids at Berkeley would always tell me that. You know, they, they went up here and they stole the water. And I said, but yeah, what about all the people in L.A.? Oh, they just use the water to wash their cars. They don't need all that water, you know. And so they're going, oh, they need it to flush the toilets, you know, what about that? Well, you don't need as much to flush the toilets, and on and on and on. Well, anyway, what would have happened if L.A. hadn't taken the water out of the Owens Valley? Well, the answer is you could have done agriculture in that valley for about 70 to 100 years. So they'd be done by now. Why? Well, because of alkaline buildup. Alkaline buildup. You're in a desert atmosphere, and when you're, when you're planting crops in the desert, you got to use four-fifths of the water for flushing the salts out and one-fifth of the water for the crop. So it's very inefficient. You can run five crops a year sometimes. If you're in places like Mexicali or Holtville, they run five crops of carrots a year in Holtville down near the Mexican border. But it's not the most efficient use of water because of the, the salt issue. Overdrafting aquifers. One of the problems we have is you get out in these big valleys that you tend to have in the basin and range. Welcome to Las Vegas. This is what it looks like around Las Vegas. And you go, now wait a minute. Where do all these clays come from? From the dry lakes. Back uh, when you got in the, um, coming out of the Ice Age, coming into the Holocene, it was raining a heck of a lot more. In fact, Salt Lake City was under 700 feet of water. It's called Lake Bonneville. And over in uh, Reno, Carson City, they were under hundreds of feet of something called Lake Lahontan. Huge inland lakes. And so you had the deposition of all these fine-grained sediments. And then you had these mountains being lifted up very rapidly by tectonics. And so you have all these coarse gravels around them. And of course, the coarse gravels are what everybody wants to drill into and put their straw into. <laughs> Suck that groundwater out, baby. Make that land valuable. And so what happens is when you suck this water out, 
you change the effective stress on this saturated clay. And the saturated clay just collapses like crazy. And this is your number one geotechnical problem in the basin and range. In Arizona, it is out of control. They actually have an aqueduct, the Palo Verde Aqueduct, built in the late 70s, coming from the Colorado River at uh, Lake Havasu. And they have places that aqueduct every year gets broken. And then when it gets broken like this, the couple, you know, cracks a couple inch high, all of a sudden that water goes into those cracks, and all of a sudden the aqueduct's 30 feet down in the ground, gone. Just gone. And they got all this water pouring into it, and they got to shut everything down and go out there and rebuild all of it. It's one of the number one uh, engineering problems uh, in the country. Because where's everybody moving to? Where's the population center of the United States? Edgar Springs for the 2000 census. Where was it in the 1990 census? Steelville, Missouri. The population center is moving toward the southwest. Everybody wants to live in that direction. That's where all the new development is. Even in the state of Missouri, it's all down in Branson. See? So everybody's moving down there, but the geotechnical problems they have in these places are huge. They really are. Why do you think I live here? All right. Subsidence due to groundwater withdrawal. I'm looking at Silicon Valley right here. There's San Jose, downtown San Jose, San Jose, Santa Clara, Sunnyvale, Aliso, there's Stanford, Palo Alto. This area has had groundwater withdrawal for agriculture starting about 1915, and by 1935, it was completely out of control. They had lowered the groundwater table in San Jose 330 feet just from overdrafting for truck crops down in these valleys. And so they had to pass a referendum, create the Santa Clara Valley Water Conservation District. They built dams back down here. And they, had, they came up here with a system of, um, of trying to conserve water and not pumping so much water. And uh, when I was in college, of course, this was a great eco disaster. And this water wasn't going to come back for thousands of years. Well, it came back up in 1983. And that surprised everybody uh, that in just a... Uh, basically a, a 45 year period, they could get the, the groundwater back up. But here's what happened. Here's actually showing you the groundwater levels. They started pumping 1915. Water's going down, 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 down. Here's where they had the referendum, creating the district. Here's what downtown San Jose is doing. It's settling. And when you start having feet of settlement, your sewers don't work anymore. Sewers are typically laid out on very low gradients, half a percent to one percent. So if you start settling here, uh, you start having problems getting the sewage to go where it's supposed to go, which um, people start noticing that one. They may not notice the groundwater table going down, but they do notice the sewage not running out of their house. Uh, somehow that catches their attention. And um, you can see here, they had a really good program uh, during the war of uh, the groundwater coming back up. That's because they weren't producing as much. And then they started drilling and withdrawing more and more water as the industrialization occurred after World War II. And you can see here, it got down to an all-time low by 1963. And you can see what happened here. They had a lot of damage here. So they passed more laws and said, okay, can't withdraw any more water. We got to get this thing, get it to recover. And it did recover completely by uh, 19, mid-1980s. But you can see what happened to the ground service. The ground service is permanently settled over here. And the amount of settlement you had uh, was on the order of 10 feet. That's a lot of settlement for a pipe conveyance system. All right, we'll stop there and have a little break for five minutes and then come back and pick this up.
I actually have a, a book about that, you know, a memoir on that, if you want to read it, that I did for the uh, Grand Canyon River Guides a couple years ago. Because I was the only guy on the river in the 83 flood that ran it at 93,000 CFS. How fast were you I didn't get any, I didn't get, as the only trip I ever went on, I didn't get any blisters. All I got was an upset stomach. How fast was the boat paddling? You know? 18 feet per second. Yeah. Yeah. On the, on the rapids. Going about, going about double that. Usually it's nine in the rapids. I was going about 18. I have pictures of it on my website. Big war shout. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, let's pick it back up here. Um, this actually shows you the subsidence in the San Joaquin Valley. And the San Joaquin Valley has a lot of um, debris flow fans because of the San Andreas Fault being right along here. And that's lifted up this coast range very rapidly. The Sierra Nevadas have lifted up fairly rapidly. There's a big active East Sierra Fault Zone going down the back of that. And so this um, basin is filled up very, very rapidly with a lot of material that is subject to hydro compression and to uh, compression through the withdrawal of groundwater. Two different mechanisms. So here is actually Joe Poland, kind of the father of uh, groundwater geology in California. He worked for the USGS Water Resources Division his whole career. And he's actually standing next to a sign right here. And he's showing you that between 1925 and 1975, the ground settled from here all the way down to there, 1977. So 30 feet of settlement over that 50-year period. Uh, that's a pretty dramatic rate of settlement. But that's what you have going on in other places like Kazakhstan. It's even worse around the uh, Caspian Sea due to withdrawal. Um, ground saltwater intrusion is a fairly perverse problem along coastal lowlands where you have uh, overdrafting of the fresh groundwater. And that's because the salt water comes in underneath the groundwater because salt water is more dense. So the fresh groundwater floats on the more dense salt water. Salt water has a density of 1.03 and um, the fresh groundwater density of 1. And of course this gets more brackish as you go in. So you start out here at 1.03, 1.02, 1.01, that kind of a thing. And so this happened in Downey, California, back in 1957, not far from where I grew up in Los, East Los Angeles County. And uh, they had a well here that was uh, about a 12 or 16 inch diameter well. And then, of course, they were, they were pulling on it like 8,000 gallons a day or something higher than that. There was a very, very high yield well. And all of a sudden, people started getting brackish water coming in to their, uh, to their treatment plant and it started attacking the galvanized pipes, as you can imagine, fairly rapidly. And so they had to come in, up with a system of coming in out here and putting in injection wells, which are all along the, uh, the, the Santa Ana River Plain and the San Gabriel River Plain and the LA River Plain, three major rivers that come out, and they have to inject 10,000 GPM, or 10,000 gallon per minute injection wells to try and keep this from going too far inland. Now, Downey, I should tell you, Downey's like, you know, 13, 14 miles inland. It's not, it's not right by the coast, by a stretch. It's quite a ways inland. So that was a big surprise to everybody. Um, this is the Oxnard Plain down near Ventura. And uh, they had a similar problem here, only here, the uh, groundwater withdrawal was all for uh, agriculture on the lower Santa Clara River. And so they had the same problem happen there in the late 50s. They started getting brackish water intrusion. Again, many miles inland, seven and a half miles inland. And so they had to start managing it uh, responsibly. Israel had the same problem. This actually shows Israel's coastal aquifer, shows that the coastal aquifer was above sea level in 1959. They overdrafted it and just uh, you know, 14 years later, 1973, it had changed dramatically, and they had a saltwater intrusion problem. Now, the Israelis are very clever. They love to use a lot of um, um, technology, and they actually were the first to look at trying to actually build a... Um, this is looking along the coast here, and these are transverse to that section. They actually looked at building a cutoff wall, a slurry trench cutoff wall, 
along this whole coastline. And of course, it got into billions of dollars pretty quickly. You can't do a slurry cutoff wall over miles and miles and miles like this, you know, hundreds of miles. It just doesn't, doesn't work. And of course, plus the, the depths would be very, very considerable. So um, they have to do different things there to actually control it. And I, I see here I lost my, hang on here. <laughs> let's do, uh, let's see what's going on here. I lost my words, polluted, it's red. Yeah, okay, brackish water, I'll use blue for that. So the brackish water is what they're actually putting in to um, stem it. And uh, that's actually been working pretty well for them. They were the first, peop first uh, country to ever do that. And a lot of other countries have now followed suit and are doing the same thing, using brackish water because it's much cheaper to uh, try and uh, stem the, the tide of the uh, intrusion. All right, so what we're talking about there is they'll come in right, you know, they have a problem here with the salt water coming in. They have a dispersion zone here you got to stay out of, especially if you've got steel casing. So they're coming in here after the, um, it advances on them. This is what, how they got into trouble. So here's where they're withdrawing. So they're coming in out here and injecting brackish water in that zone to try and move this thing back down so it stays away from their withdrawal points. All right. In the Ozarks, we have a problem with sewage uh, because we have extremely permeable aquifers. They're like interstate highways, like cars. So you get water gets in there, boom, it travels 50 miles in just a couple days. Uh, five days is, is untypical at all. And sewage often becomes purified as it passes a few dozen meters of an aquifer composed of fine grain material, but you get no purification if it's just traveling along an, you know, an underground river. As not gonna, you're not going to get anything happening that's really good. And so one of the problems we have is, you know, what kind of laws do you set up at Jeff City for dealing with septic tanks and how far septic tanks should be from uh, your well? And so we have a law, and uh, most states have a law that they have to be at least 75 feet apart. Well, some lawyer who didn't have a geology degree came up with that one, 75 feet. That has to do with the size of a lot. That's what that has to do with. It doesn't have anything to do with science. So would you want to have your well 75 feet down gradient from your neighbor's septic tank? Uh, I wouldn't want to do that. That didn't sound like a good idea to me. So septic tank and the contamination you have in this kind of an area, this is going to be uh, a problem that's very spotty, and it just depends on the geology and on how well these things are managed. Things that get put in the ground tend to get forgotten and not managed very well. That's been my experience. They tend not to get managed at all. And you also, you see, you don't have a straight line flow, but you know, by the time you discover you've got a problem here, uh, mitigating it is going to be very, very problematic. You're going to have to drill a new well. You're going to have to seal off this whole zone and withdraw from way down here somewhere. Uh, to get around that problem. So um, we haven't really visited upon this one too much except at commercial sites down around Springfield uh, where we've had some problems with things leaking uh, where they put in, uh, spend enough money to try and figure out what's going on. What the problem you have is this one right here. This is more, this is the kind of, you get in class, homogeneous, isotropic, doesn't exist in the real world. It's good for midterm exams. Here's what you actually have in the real world. You got layered systems, some of the layers are parallel to the ground surface. Some of the layers are controlled by structural geology. Sometimes you have faults in here. But anyway, you can get down here on something like this and travel very, very quickly and get down here to this point uh, more quickly than you'd like to have happen. Well, groundwater can also be contaminated by um, both um, fertilizers and pesticides. This is a major, major problem. Uh, for St. Louis, uh, the water we withdraw for the treatment plant at Chain of Rocks comes out of the Mississippi River. Where's the water in the Mississippi River come from? From the farm fields of Nebraska and Iowa and Illinois. And uh, they are going to be putting all sorts of fertilizers into that, uh, those fields. 
and how the concentrations of those fertilizers change every day, every year, depending on how much it's raining. Remember I told you there's no reproducibility to that? Well, when you design Chain of Rocks treatment plant, you design a water treatment plant like you design a crude oil cracking plant, refinery. You design it for a specific chemistry. What are the things we're trying to take out? One of the things we don't take out is gasoline. So when somebody spills gasoline in, the only thing you can do is flush it to the ocean. Yeah, that's frightening. Yeah, you can't treat it, you can't take the gasoline out of it, no. Nobody's figured out a way of doing that. One ppm gasoline, you're not going to want to have your kids drinking it in there with their meals. You're going to flush it out to the ocean. Ouch. And what about the guys in the ocean? Well, they don't have attorneys, so that gets, gets sent to them. That's where it goes, okay? So this whole issue of can we come up with better fertilizers that have more natural components, yeah, that's going to be in our, in our interest long term. We have a big problem right now in St. Louis with the water treatment plant. In fact, they're looking at replacing it completely with a system of deep wells near the confluence. Uh, Black & Veatch has been designing that. And uh, they're going to take that water out from 100 feet plus down to get away from the modern-day pollutant effects. Um, we also have things like uh, landfills. And landfills are always a wild card because they produce leachates, and the leachates like a coffee. It's got you know, it doesn't look good, it doesn't smell good, and uh, and you're not going to want to get it in your groundwater system. And so uh, uh, we're spending a lot of money chasing that one, and that's a big issue for people like Fred Weber who want to take the old limestone mines, and when they're done getting limestone out of it, they want to turn it into a landfill and put trash in it, make money on it. Well, is that a good idea? in a karst environment. Our, our geological survey has not permitted a new landfill in the Ozarks in decades because we live on karst. And they just can't, they can't see how you can make karst work to fight against pollution. So every time I go up to Jefferson City and I have a glad-handing session with the politicians, and as soon as I say the word geological engineer, bam, they hit me with this, you know. Why don't you go down and talk to those geological survey people and tell them to quit sending all of our trash to Illinois and to Kansas? Well, that's what we do right now. We send our trash from St. Louis metro area to Illinois. And Illinois gets, you know, millions of dollars a year of our money to take our trash. Same thing with Kansas, for Kansas City. And we can't, you know, so the, the political pressure, you can see it rising right now. The political pressure is being put on the Geological Survey over here to start permitting landfills inside the state of Missouri. So is trash a political football? You bet. And the mafia is all over the trash industry. They love it. They, they started that in Italy, very wisely, because what are the two things you're gonna produce? Sewage and trash. You know, you don't have to get people addicted to those like heroin and other things. It's a lot easier. You know, they, they produce it. They're living, they're breathing, they're producing those things. So the guy who treats that stuff and has a cartel on it, you know, I think Italy. How many Italy? How many? Uh, Italy has a record number of um, strikes for uh, trash collection. What, every year they have six strikes a year or something. It's, 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 it's phenomenal. Yeah, because the, uh, the mafia owns it and they just want to keep upping the price on it. And what's your... What are you going to do if they don't pick up the trash? You leave it in bags and it accumulates. Well, it's a big problem. All right, well withdrawals. And so where do you want to put the well? I mean, obviously, you don't want to have the well too close to where the septic system is going in. <laughs> or you could have a problem. You'd like to be up gradient if you have a septic system down gradient. And what you learn in school, when I went to school, we took, you know, in the early days of environmental engineering, we called it sanitary engineering in those days. It didn't sound nearly as good. It sounded like, you know, sanitary pads, so nobody wanted to major in that. So we changed the name to environmental engineering, and everybody flocked to it. And, um, and you know, what we were taught was the solution to pollution is dilution. So the big thing is, you know, if you can dilute this enough, it's not going to be a problem. Well, that doesn't fly anymore. The solution to pollution is to do some sort of engineering solution, not just, you know, say, you know, dilute it. And so these kind of things uh, are really going to come home to roost on us where you have geologic situations 
where the gradient's going the wrong way for the high yield well, like you see right here. This is the kind of situation you're going to hear about it. This kind of situation you're never going to hear about it because it's not creating a problem yet. This might be a problem if that keeps going for you know a couple centuries. Who knows? But you're also going to have a lot of filtering, natural filtering that occurs over a few centuries. All right, geologic work of groundwater. From a, from a human life perspective, we don't think about this stuff very much, but groundwater dissolves rock because groundwater is mildly acidic. Yes, it's natural groundwater without you know, all the coal-fired plants burning. It's mildly acidic. It has weak carbonic acid that forms when the rainwater dissolves carbon dioxide in the air and you have decaying plant matter, which adds to that. So that carbonic acid reacts with the calcite in the limestone to get calcium bicarbonate, which is this stuff right here. This little, this is made out of calcium. These straws are made out of calcium bicarbonate. So that, that's a big issue around here. The one great benefit we have in living in hillbilly land is we shouldn't get osteoporosis around here. We have, very, we have the nation's lowest incidence of that. We have a lot of other things we're the highest in, you know, but we do not have problems with uh, bones breaking as much around here. It's probably from eating all the venison, too. Um, weak carbonic acid is going to dissolve carbonate rocks. So we have a million square miles of carbonate rocks under us in the Midwestern United States. And so you have water going through this stuff. It's going to go down here, and you're going to have these cavernous zones that form in the zone of aeration. Now, this would all be simple if the zone of aeration always remained constant, but it doesn't because we don't have as much water today as we had 11,000 years ago. So 90% of the time over the last 1.6 million years, we had a lot more water running through the system. We had a steeper gradient because sea level was 360 feet lower than it is today. And so what we have right now is a very temporal system where we have lower gradient feeding out to the ocean, we're rising base level, and we don't have as much water flushing through the system. So keep that in mind for where we're going here. So what are some of the things we find in these caverns? We can actually date these things, these speleothems. Uh, we call these speleothems, that's the stalactites and stalagmites, and um, the stalactites hang from the ceiling, the stalagmites build up from the floor. We can actually date those, and they've actually done this in the Grand Canyon region to actually figure out how the Grand Canyon was formed. It was formed from west to east as a headward eroding channel system that got through to Lake Bitty Hochi and, and stole the Little Colorado system and then the San Juan system and so on and so forth. They have a pretty good picture of it now. Here's the speleothems at, at Carlsbad Caverns, southeastern New Mexico. If you ever get a chance to go there, stop and go. It's really pretty effortless. You walk all the way downhill. It's nice and cool. You can have a fried chicken dinner down at the bottom when you get there, and you can take the elevator out. I mean, this one, if you've got adult onset diabetes, this is your vacation. Um, here's what it looks like inside uh, Carlsbad Caverns, some of the straws. They don't let the, the public walk right near, but this is taken from where the uh, tour goes along on the concrete sidewalk. And karst topography. If we actually look around uh, Missouri, we actually see a lot of this in southern Missouri. Landscapes that have been shaped by dissolved power of groundwater have deranged drainages and all these little closed depressions filled with water. And this stuff is slowly uh, uh, dissolving, and you have a striking lack of surface drainage. You don't have the dendritic drainage network very well developed because everything's just going straight down. So karst topography starts out something like this. And then as you get deeper and deeper incised, you see these bomb craters all over the place. These are old. These are sinkholes feeding down into pipes. And then as it gets more and more well-developed, like Southeast Asia, you actually get tower karst in Canton province down in China, which is spectacular. You get these things that are 300 meters high, uh, tower cars, and you actually have systems here that are multiple systems, where you have strata in here like shale lenses, 
They create multiple systems. And you can actually see the evidence of groundwater being higher before and lower now or vice versa. And that's the key thing for us as engineers is to appreciate the geomorphic evolution, the geologic history. This is really, really key. You have to understand, you know, where am I in this whole thing? Am I putting my tunnel down here or am I putting my tunnel up there? Makes a big difference. Down here, you can pump till hell freezes over and never get all the water out of the damn tunnel, okay? So you better bring your scuba gear with you. Up here, you can do all kinds of things. It's a completely different job, just depending where you are. Now, oh, there's tower cars, by the way, what it looks like, spectacular. Um, the thing we're all afraid of, especially if you live down here near, near Ozark, down uh, is this, you know, the sinkhole. And uh, a lot of sinkholes tend to be centered on some sort of development because sometimes these people are pumping water down into the ground through their leach field, their septic system, and they're artificially recharging and causing a concentration, a point source of moisture, which is exacerbating the formation of this sinkhole. This sinkhole would not have occurred in modern time absent that unnatural concentration of water. And this is a big problem along highways in Tennessee. For years and years, Tennessee DOT didn't want to pave their, their um, shoulders because they would cost them, you know, $45 a lineal foot to put in the pavement. And they kept getting sinkholes along the river, along the, uh, all the way along the highways. Finally, they had to just bite the bullet and realize, well, if we don't pave it, we're not going to have any control on where these things occur. And they're going to start impacting our highways and costing us a lot of money. Now, they did that originally saying, well, when we get these sinkholes, then we get federal money, 75% matching money to fix the problem. But the problem is you don't get any money for the interruption of traffic because it takes some time between here and when you get the problem fixed. And in the meantime, you're not running Kenworths and Peterbilt's up and down the highway. So that's a big economic impact. And they've had more interstate highway closures with sinkholes and rock slides in Tennessee going over into North Carolina than California has ever had. So you think of California as being the big place with the geohazards. No. Tennessee has got the, is a place that has the highways getting closed by rock slides all the time. I-40 between Asheville and Knoxville gets closed all the time. Here's what one looks like. This is the Exeter sink over in Berry County a couple years ago, March 2005. Jim Van Dyke, the state hydrogeologist, took this picture. You can see the people for scale. This is just out in the middle of a pasture. It's not along a present day channel because these are paleo karst features. These are developed off of things that were actually uh, formed back in Mississippian time. And so these are paleo karst and somehow this is collapsed and you have one heck of a big feature there. You can even see the stratigraphy along here, very well developed Holocene soil, A horizon, B horizon, Wow, this has been here. This fill has been here a long time. Now, you go around here, and it's just nothing but fill. That just looks like artificial fill all the way around. So that's, that's been there a long, long time. Here's an old sinkhole. <laughs> old sinkholes look like old shell holes. Looks like somebody came in here and dropped a huge bomb. And basically, it's just a closed depression. And that would be a good spot to avoid. You don't want to build your house on that unless it's your mother-in-law and you don't get along with her. Um, now, what do they also use these for in the Ozarks? They use them sinkhole dump, because here you can dump the stuff over and it sinks away. And uh, everybody said, you know, they come here from other places like California and they say, why do they leave all their trash out like this? You know, is this, you know? and the reason is they charge you at the dump by the pound. So you take an old Caterpillar tractor or something to the dump, you're going to pay $10,000 to get rid of it. Now, in California, they got laws on that kind of thing. They'll, they'll come get you, put you in prison, you know. But back here, you just find a sink hole like this, and you drop it in there and cover it up with some dirt. And what the heck? That's going to give an archaeologist something to find someday. You're actually, you know, you're, it's a societal benefit, right? Yeah. All right. Now, there's all kind, karst, in the world of karst and caving, there's all kinds of technical terms, just like medicine. 
So you have all these different things underground. This is Kuala Lumpur, and this is a, you know, all of Southeast Asia is karst, heavily karstified. And so you have these big haystack cliffs and underground, you know, uh, hummocks. And we call this a cliff. Of course, that's an overhang. And then you have pinnacles, floaters. Floaters are a real common problem when you're drilling. You think you're in bedrock, you're not. We call this uh, cutters and pinnacles. And you have cavities and all sorts of things. This is a collapsed cavity, which is not uncommon at all. And then sinkhole, finally like this. And you tend to get a sinkhole above a pipe leading down to some place where there's water moving. So we have here is fines are piping down here and then they're getting dispersed in here. This is the conveyor belt. So you're only going to get a sinkhole if you're over something where you have an interstate highway of water moving through it. So this becomes your goal is to find these guys and be careful what you do in terms of blocking this seepage path because the fines are piping down here. Over here it's not, not so much a problem. Well, if we look at systems, this is Mammoth Cave, Kentucky, which is probably the most studied car system uh, in the United States. And we're looking at here is, uh, yeah, I got a little, I got some typos here, hang on. Comparison between, where's the delete key? Wow, there it is. Huh, that's not working. Oh well. Hmm. I'll have to fix it later. I don't know, I can't figure out how to fix it on here. Never hit the delete key and not have it do deletes before. Let's see. Shift, delete. Yeah, there we go. All right. This is a comparison between the measured heads and the simulated heads in the homogeneous porous medium channel network. And so if you looked at a groundwater homogeneous isotropic thing like you get from visual mod flow, this is the kind of model you would have. And this is the kind of model they actually have under there. And what this shows you is you have an underground developed system because of all these pipes that's far below the theoretical groundwater surface. So when you get into a large karst network, you have these interstate flow highways. Look at all these coming off right here. This is a very steep face right here. Just sliding down here. So you have these pipes that have very, very high flows concentrated. It's an underground flowage system that does not reflect itself in the surface topography. And that's why karst is so dangerous. You have to understand this. You really, you can't do this from being a, a theoretical uh, egghead who, who, who plays with computer programs. You need to be one of those muddy, spelunker club type folk that get out and get in these things to realize how hideously three-dimensional and complicated they really are. There's a channel network that's been developed over eons of time. Well, here's where this comes in with the engineering uh, point of view. Now, this is this is a more work again in uh, in Mammoth Cave area. If you go back and look at Mammoth Cave and you say, okay, um, when sea level was 350 feet lower, here's the drainage system that eventually is leading out to the Gulf of Mexico. And so I have karst system developed above that line. This is karstified up here. This is not karstified because this has never been unsaturated, never been in the aerated zone. But now, sea levels come up 362 feet over the last 11,000 years, so I have channel fill. I change the base level. Now, I've heightened the water table across here, and I've got flooded karst highways beneath the water table over here. And that's fine, as long as you don't get in there and try to do things like dig tunnels. You go over here and do a dam project, try to dig a tunnel through there, and hit one of these underground interstate flow highways, you're going to know about it in no time at all. Uh-oh, I've gone past my time. So we're going to stop there today and pick this thing up.
I'm way past my time, I guess. Is that right? Okay, they haven't changed the clock. That's what it is. Sorry. All right. I wondered what happened there. All right, they need to change the clock. All right, so this, this little thing I just showed you, this is the critical thing we deal with, like on uh, Wolf Creek Dam over here on the Cumberland River. Now, the reason we're having the problems at Wolf Creek Dam is this issue right here. We have incredible karst development at great depth below the water table. And back when they built those projects, they never considered the karst being extensive hundreds of feet below the modern water table. That caught everybody by surprise. And that was discovered on Kentucky Dam in 1940. Okay, so here's what I'm talking about. If I go in and I go to put a water supply tunnel up here, and I'm above this valley fill and this new water table line, I'll be okay. But if I have to put it, my tunnel down here, and I happen to run into one of these, there's no draining this thing. You get these pipes that are just incredible. There's no head loss. Water gets in here and just poosh. You're going to drain the entire state. So when you get in here, you've got to be real careful to seal off your tunnel from one of these highways or dig it way back over here Well, you're not going to run into as much of this stuff. And that's, that's what I would do. I wouldn't put the tunnel over here. I wouldn't even chance it. I'd just move it back over here where I know I have very little chance of poking through one of these things. So doing tunnels in karst is a real uh, dice roll. All right. Sinkholes in Missouri. Do we have sinkholes in Missouri? Boy, do we. And again, down here is the Ozarks. And the Ozarks are not glaciated, so lots and lots of shallow karst. North of the Missouri River, right here, you're glaciated. So you don't see nearly as much. There's a little bit of them over here up near Hannibal as you come down uh, in the St. Louis limestone down here. It's Jefferson County. But mostly it's in the Ozarks where you have the problem. Now, that's what a losing stream looks like next to us over here in Laclede County over near Fort Wood. It looks like a dirt road. And you're going, that's a crick? How am I going to fish for trout in that crick? Well, you're not going to fish for trout in that crick. There ain't no trout in there. But it's great for driving your 4x4 in there at night. See? See right where you got to go. It's a dry channel. It's a losing stream. It loses its water. And what you have is you have alluvium over a fractured bedrock. And this is so porous down here it's got unlimited porosity. So once this water, this water will flow down here if you have a high event. So it rains like crazy for an hour and a half or more. You overwhelm the, perme the, the uh, permeability of the bed. So water flows on it. Within a couple of days, the water's gone. It seeps through the alluvium and goes down into the fractures, these big open fractures. Those are the permeability highways. So. That's um, a gaining stream setting would be like that, where you have water in here, and you actually are feeding water into the channel. We don't have that kind of scenario in the Ozarks. We have a losing stream setting, and we have countless voids down here in the bedrock for the water to seep into. And the water table's down there at some greater depth. Now notice the water table moves around locally depending on these major fractures. So it's going to be higher between them and lower when you're right within them because you don't need pressure head to push water through open fractures. So here's typical losing streams. Here's one where you have a channel that gets flow fairly regularly but doesn't maintain flow probably ever more than seven days. And then here, where you don't get much flow, the bed of the channel completely grows in with vegetation. So here, I can get away with doing an Arizona dip with my roadway. Here, I actually have to have some sort of structure there because it has um, discharge in it more often, although it doesn't sustain. Well, here we are on I-44 near Springfield, Missouri, 
You see they pre-split a line for a new highway alignment there. This is the highway between I-44 and 65 heading down to Branson. And they got these caverns that they ran into and have to deal with. And they have to actually come back in here and fill this with gabions or with rock or with something, because otherwise you can get a collapse uh, potential in it. This is actually some work by Professor Neil Anderson and uh, Derek Appel in mining with engineering. Where they went out for MoDOT and looked at this pinnacle and cutter system down there along US 65. And what you see is it's very, very regular and linear. It's controlled by jointing. So this is a joint cluster running right along here, going this way. And then you have orthogonal jointing coming this direction. And so you tend to get these boxes where all the stuff has been dissolved away and is gone. So the pinnacles and the cutters are between the orthogonal joint system. This is the kind of thing we get today using very, very inexpensive uh, soil resistivity arrays and then stitching them together on a computer. And for, you know, for just a couple thousand dollars, you get a three-dimensional view of a very complexly eroded surface, which guess what? The only view that counts here is the three-dimensional view. If I cut two-dimensional views anywhere here, you would not come away with the same picture. It would really lie to you, especially if I put it right through here, or I ran a section right down here. So where do you want to put the highway? Well, you want to put the highway right down there, or put the highway over here or something, I don't know. But you can see it's highly dissected. And you'd like to know that when you're going to put any kind of high value structure in here, like a bridge foundation or building foundation, anything like that. All right, here's inside Fisher Cave. Now, one of the neat things about being a spelunker is the, the cave fills in Missouri. We have cave fills in Missouri where this surface is soft and has tracks that are soft, unfossilized, look like they were put there yesterday, that are 100,000 years old. That's one of the only places in the world you're going to find that. Why? Because this is the most stable part of the Western Hemisphere craton, right here, the Ozark. Nothing exciting ever happens here except, you know, Walmart parking lot on Saturday night. Um, this is very, very stable. And these sediments have not lithified. And so it's amazing what you can find in them. Here's Courthouse Cave on the current river. And there's what it looks like as you go inside of it. And as you get inside of it, what you find is the mud ripples inside that attest to much higher discharge in the recent geologic past. So this thing had a lot of water coming through it. This was an interstate highway of water coming through here flowing at the viewer up to about probably uh, seven to 11,000 years ago. Here's Jam Up Cave. It's another one on Jack's Fork. If you don't think it's big, that's a person for scale right there. So this is a structurally controlled uh, feature. That's some shearing along a joint system. There's people for scale, the two spelunkers. And there's some websites you can learn more about caves. If you haven't gone out with any of the spelunkers, get at least one field trip in. Go buy some clothes that you don't want to keep because it'll ruin your clothes. But it's really worth going to get the experience of just seeing um, underground. Now, <clears throat> what um, I'm going to go hit this next time, and I'm going to start you on the, a different lecture, which is about uh, my work in New Orleans. All right. I don't know what that means. Let's see.
I get it to open. All right. Now this is a uh, a Part E lecture I did for the uh, Geological Society of America meeting a couple of years ago. This is one where they invite the media and all the students and stuff to it, and um, it touches on what are some of the mechanisms that drive land subsidence and uh, what we can do as a nation about it. Um, I start out with this whole thing, and I, I call it, I use the word survivability. The politically correct word today is resilience. Resilience means if you're going to build something, you should build it so that it's not going to have a catastrophic failure. This is a levee right here, and this levee is being overtopped by a Katrina, and after Katrina was done, the levee was still there. It did not fail catastrophically. It had some erosion, but it did not fail catastrophically because it had some clay in it. Clay is very important for the survivability of a levee, both from seepage-induced erosion as well as runoff-induced erosion. And we learned a lot about runoff-induced erosion and seepage erosion in Katrina. I even learned some things. And we used to think that this was the critical place, but it turns out it's not. It actually, the, the, the erosion actually starts right about here. It starts about two-thirds of the way down the slope. And when it breaks through the rooted zone, you're gone if you don't have enough clay in the embankment. Um, here's the kind of embankments they had down there. They're made out of oyster shells. Oyster shells do not have any cohesion. They don't have any binder. If you don't add the binder, you need to add. If you're going to use oyster shells, which are great for bearing capacity, that's the only kind of gravel they have in Louisiana. They don't have any rock gravel. So they use oyster shells. But if you're going to use oyster shells, you're going to have to stitch them together with cement. You have to add some cement to the mix, or it's just going to be gone when you run high-velocity water over it. So when you flew over these levees made out of silt and made out of oyster shells, the levees were just gone because these were organic-rich materials, and they just disappeared when they were overtopped by the high water of the hurricane. And other areas, they put in steel sheet pile cutoff walls along these. And it still just took all the erodible material that comprised the levee and just uh, washed it away. And that's because that material was silt and organic silts and oozes. Now, you can also, you can cover these materials that are erodible, you can cover them with less eroding clayey cover. But you gotta watch the transition zones where you do that because when you again when you get when you bite through the rooted zone and through the clay layer, then you get into the stuff that's much more erodible, the low cohesion fill. And this particular area, the clay costs thirty dollars or eighty dollars a cubic yard to bring it in from Mississippi and, and use a bottom dump barge to get it in there. Well, if we look at the gulf um, at that time of uh, Katrina, the, the gulf was losing an average of 35 square miles of land a year. This is what it actually looks like. When you look on a, a kid's um, geography map or National Geographic, it shows all this as being solid color. All this little dispersed white stuff is all the land that's been lost since 1935. And it's an average of about 35 square miles of land a year that dips under the ocean and uh, in the delta. And it's 44 square miles a year of wetlands that are being lost out here. And the wetlands help to mollify the energy effects of the storm surges. Uh-oh, I guess I can't. I have to have that thing going. Huh. Technical help. Is this going to keep? Oh, it is going to work. Okay. All right. So, in flying over the delta after the storm, we noticed there were huge tracts of land that were now water, <laughs> that used to be land. And when you go out here and investigate, it turned out 
This was not land as you and I would think of terra firma. It's floating marsh. But the marsh mat is so thick, five feet thick, you could drive a drilling rig out there, a 100,000 pound drilling rig, and drill a hole through it. But it's a floating marsh. So a lot of this got whipped up in like a mix master into the uh, atmosphere. And as an engineer, I got to ask myself the question, can I construct sustainable levees on these kinds of materials? The answer is no. I can put levees here right next to the river where I have some soil type material. But once I get back here into the slack water and I got floating marsh, I'm not going to build much on the floating marsh except houseboats. I can float aircraft carriers in it. Okay. During Hurricane Katrina, this is going toward the Gulf. This is going towards Lake Bourne. New Orleans is right up here, out of the picture, above my finger. Um, in that one six-hour period, the light blue area here is the land loss. It's 115 square miles of land lost in that one day. Now, the average rate was 35 per year. So in one day, they lost 115 square miles. So if you factor that in now, the new average is probably up around 40 something per year. So it was a big event. Here's the big problem. Um, Central Louisiana is subsiding at an average rate of about seven millimeters per year right now. And sea level is coming up at about three millimeters a year if we look back at the last 100 years. And, be, and, and beyond. So over the next 100 years, we can expect a net differential of about one meter. Now, if that happens, 100 years from now, here's where the coastline is going to be, way up here. And where's New Orleans? Well, there's New Orleans. New Orleans is going to be out here on the distal end of the Mississippi River that's not underneath water. The, the modern-day delta in Plaquemines Parish is all going to be underwater. And see, Homa is going to be sitting out there like an offshore oil derrick farm. It's got dikes around it, and it's going to have this little lifeline coming back. And here's Baton Rouge way back here. Um, and Baton Rouge right now is, you know, is 170 miles from the ocean. So one meter? 39.4 inches? Makes that much difference? Yeah, go down there and look around. Everything be flat down there. You could see Dolly Parton from 20 miles away down there. It's so flat. That's politically incorrect, I know. But anyway, very flat. All right. So what are the mechanisms driving the ground settlement? It's not simple. And what I found out when I went down there and interviewed people, I got pretty frustrated because everybody wanted to blame somebody. And they all wanted to blame the Corps of Engineers, and they wanted to blame Shell Oil Companies, all the oil companies' fault, because oil companies got, are wealthy. They got deep pockets. And in reality, it's no one mechanism that's driving all of it. It's a whole bunch of mechanisms, a dozen different mechanisms, and that's why I wanted to expose you to it in this lecture. So there's many different causes, and I'm going to briefly summarize those in these slides. There is where the geologist always starts. If I'm going to communicate geology to an engineering audience, the way I do it is with block diagrams. And usually I color them. I haven't got around to coloring this one yet. But there is the diagram, very similar to the one Carl Terzaghi used when he was down here doing the early pioneering work on subaqueous submarine landslides. There's 10 times as many subaqueous landslides each day on the earth as there are on the continents under the water. That's where most of the big landslides occur. Big landslides. How big are these landslides, Dave? Oh, they're 15 miles long. They're big, really big. And these landslides interdict oil company pipelines all the time out here. Every year, oil companies are losing their trunk lines to their offshore platforms out here by underwater landslides, especially when you get out here on the continental slope where things are much steeper. And you have diapiric masses, rising salt domes. You have all sorts of normal faulting 
going on. Here's more of the rising salt domes. So this land's lifting up. This land is moving out and dropping down underneath the water. This is sea level here. So all this action is going on beneath sea level that affects the coastal zone up here where CNN and Fox can film things. They can't film stuff out here. They don't go underwater yet. And so you got a lot of stuff going on and it's very, very exceedingly complicated geologically in three dimensions. All right, so you have fluid extraction of oil, gas, and water. One guy with the USGS has blamed oil and gas extraction for everything. And uh, I think that's way overly simplified because you see a lot of these same features in areas where they're not extracting oil and gas. So that's not the only thing going on. It's just very obvious to a lot of people. Like you, you can't explain the Baton Rouge fault zone with oil and gas extraction. Um, if we go to the oil industry and we look at their geologic cross sections through the delta, it looks like this. And it's wild tectonically. What are all these things? These are huge faults. They're huge gravity faults. Well, how big are they, Dave? Well, this is the Cretaceous down here at 30,000 feet. 30,000 feet, six miles down. That's the Cretaceous, 63 million years ago. This has all been deposited, six miles of sediment that's been deposited in the last 60 million years. And it's just splintered by active faults. Well, why don't we hear about earthquakes down there? We only hear about California. You don't hear about earthquakes down here because this stuff is so soft, it just deforms plastically. You don't get earthquakes out of it. It's not brittle enough to give you a big shake in earthquake. It's just like fat man, you know, slobbering on the couch on Saturday night after drinking too much beer. It just kind of... just kind of moves. You don't get earthquakes. You don't get stick slip. You get slob, moving like the blob. That's what you get. So these are listric normal faults. And they cut everything, and they're very important to the oil industry because this is where you get your structural traps. So they've mapped these things all over the place. How many faults do they have? More than you can count. That's how many. A lot. A lot of faults. Oh, if we look at an N echelon belt, this is actually a report for the Corps of Engineers by Professor Woody Gagliano. Um, back in, the in the, uh, 1994, you have belts of these fault zones as you go inland. Here's New Orleans up here. Here's the Baton Rouge fault zone, very active zone, way back here behind where the oil and gas extraction is occurring along the coast area. So this is active, even absent, oil and gas withdrawals back here. Very active. And you can really see these on the aerial photographs. And what you see is the back of these blocks are dropping. So you get lakes along these scarps, and the water gets deeper every decade along. That's how they map these things. Because the, the material is so soft, you don't get a fault scarp. What you get is deep water. And the water gets deeper every year, and that's how Gagliano mapped all these scarps like running across the delta. Now, this is Roger Saucier's structural geologic map of the region. He's with the Corps of Engineers um, in, uh, at Erdic and uh, the Engineering and Design Research Center at Vicksburg. And these dots are salt domes, major mappable salt domes that have been documented by the oil industry, and then these little straight things are the active faults, these growth faults that perturb the entire Mississippi, Chafalaya, Delta system. And then these are folds up in here, and again, salt basins and folds and features. So there's a lot of stuff going on down there. It's a very active tectonically. You also have drainage of lowlands and back swamps for agriculture. So you start out with an area here that's just, you know, maybe a meter or two above mean sea level. 
You have a lot of peaty organic soils in these um, former marsh and swamp areas. You come in here and drain these and pump water out, and then you farm it. You're now below sea level. Most of Midtown and lower uh, New Orleans is underneath uh, below sea level, like this. And it collapses and sinks because of the oxidation of the peats. If you bring the water table down three feet, that three feet will uh, compress to about three inches. That's how compressible it is, 90% compression, because it's just organic material. So when you map the compressible PD soils, this was done back in 1962 by Gould and Morgan, you can actually see channels like Bayou Benvenu channel right here. And when you put levees across that, your levee's gonna settle a lot right here as compared to over here or over here because you have a big wedge or channel of peats along this old drainage in here. Now, when you go out in New Orleans and you just look around, you don't have to be a rocket scientist. You don't have to even be a student of Phelps County Community College. You can go along here and see, here's a street and there's a manhole. And the manhole is sticking up about a foot higher than the rest of the street. Huh, what's going on there? And then you go over here to the house right behind. And as you look along the house, the house is on wood piles and it's sitting up about 16, 18 inches above the rest of the yard. And what you find out is this area has settled 10 to 16 inches since it was developed in 1956. And these are on 31 foot deep wood piles. And they took the water table down maybe a meter, not much, but they got plenty of settlement in that upper meter or two. More pictures looking underneath the residence. Everywhere you look, you can see the ground has settled down significantly. And then here's these wood piles just the houses are sitting on. And you keep coming back in here and trying to fill this rat hole in with sand and plant things in here. So they have tremendous settlement just due to oxidation of the peats and groundwater withdrawal. Well. When you start looking at groundwater levels and uh, you look at subsidence, what you see going back to 1920 is a very clear and continuous system of subsidence tracking with groundwater withdrawal because they developed it. This is in the uh, town of Kenner out near the airport, Jefferson Parish. And again, you can see in here uh, settlement having to do with periods of tremendous groundwater withdrawal. This is uh, right in here is when they put in a new series of pumps right here after the war and then again more and so they've had tremendous amounts of settlement um, 70, 80 inches of settlement which is uh, over 8 feet approaching 10 feet in some areas. So that's groundwater withdrawal for industrial use and urban development. That's, can't sue the oil companies on that one. Uh, if you look at a uh, highly exaggerated cross-section of New Orleans, this is what it looks like. Lake Pontchartrain is sea level down here in brackish water. And the Mississippi River is uh, about five feet above sea level at its low flow line. It can actually get up to uh, all the way up to 29 24 feet above sea level before you would crest over the levee. And you can see you have this sombrero shape in the middle. This is the Metairie Gentilly Ridge. This is an old distributary of the Mississippi River from about 2,000 years ago that uh, goes through the middle midtown area and it actually uh, comes up to about six and a half feet above sea level. So if you're on Metairie Ridge, you don't get flooded out if you're in Midtown, you do get flooded out, and if you're down here, you're below mean sea level. And so when you have a catastrophic failure of a levee down in this zone, you have a large portion of the town that then is underwater. Now, in Hurricane Katrina, this is where the breaks occurred, down here, right in this zone. 
not far from this protective levee in the drainage canals. So the water came in at the lowest possible elevation right here and leaked in very, very slowly. Now, if you were living down here, you would have had to walk about this fast to get out of there and not drown. You wouldn't have had to walk very fast. You could have gone very, very slow, just like a Missouri boy goes after eating too much uh, fried food. Uh, you could have gotten out of there if you could walk. Um, what you don't want to have happen is a catastrophic break up here. If this levee were ever break, and it hasn't broken since 1859, before the Civil War, if it breaks up here, it's going to come down here and kill everybody because these guys got no way of getting out because of the head differential. It's Darcy's Law. That water is going to get there really, really fast. So the best place it could break, the sweetest place to get a break is right where it broke in, 19, in 2005, down here at the lowest possible elevation. But if it was ever to break up here, it'd be much more catastrophic in terms of loss of property and life because of the, the energy head. Now, if we go back and we look at this place, they started digging drainage canals in the 1790s. And they were trying to do was to get drainage away from the high ground. The highest ground is right along the river. So they started, uh, they, uh, started digging these drainage canals, and these were all finished by the mid-1870s. And this topographic map was made by the city engineer, L.W. Brown, in 1895. So if we take this map and compare it to today, we can actually get a picture like this and show that the net subsidence in across New Orleans was something between 2 and 10 feet over 100 years. <laughs> And these areas down here that are below sea level are the areas that have sunk the most. The interesting aberration is the brown area, which hasn't sunk. The brown area is a fill put in by the city between 1928 and 1934, and it was put on a non-peat uh, foundation out in Lake Pontchartrain. That used to be the shoreline of Lake Pontchartrain, which was coming inland a little bit every year. They put this huge hydraulic fill out here, sand fill on a silt basement, on the, on the lake's very, very shallow, and this hasn't settled because it doesn't have peats under it. This is where all the peats are, and that's the area that's settled 8 to 10 feet, and that's where the drainage canals had the breaks because they had settled so much. Now, you also have structural surcharging. If you come in here, and you put heavy structures on, like the, the Superdome. In 1983, Superdome was completed. That was the deepest pile-supported structure in the United States. Had 140-foot deep piles going down, precast concrete piles, going down into the Pleistocene gravels. The good stuff. Really good stuff. And they designed it for a Category 5 windstorm. 150 mile-an-hour winds. So how did it get all the big holes in it? Well, it got all the big holes in it because of all the cypress and gum trees blowing in the 150 mile an hour wind. They forgot about those. If you're going to design for a 100 year flood or a 100 year storm, the one thing you've got to remember is you don't just design for the water or the air. You design for what's in it. That's what's going to get you. And this thing looked like it had been hit by a bunch of Marine Corps F-18s with Mark 72 slick bombs. Just huge holes blasted in it. That's where the trees hit it and knocked the holes in it. So what are the mechanisms of ground settlement in coastal Louisiana? You have the elastic deformation of the delta from just load. Load deformation, which we, we that's where they came up with the thing, isostasy. That's where it came from. Um, they discovered that in the 1930s. Tectonic compaction caused by the formation of pressure ridges and folding. That's also causing subsidence. You have subsidence on the seaward side of the Listric growth faults, all those faults I showed you. You have the drainage of the old swamp and marsh deposits, which increases the effective stress on the underlying clays. And you have the biochemical oxidation 
of the peaty soils from drawing the water table down. Two different mechanisms. You have the consolidation of compressible soils that are surcharged with fill and structures. You have the surcharge with structural improvements like the interstate highways and the buildings. You have reduced groundwater recharge because of all the impermeable surfaces all over the city. So you have less water going into the ground and more runoff every year. They were there. And that's borne out by just the statistics of the drainage district, the sewer and water district. You have extraction of the oil, gas, and water causes pressure depletion, which drives settlement because it increases the effective stress. And you have the solutioning of salt domes and the seaward migration of low density materials like salt and shale. So you got all these things going on at the same time. And the only one you can sue is really the people pumping the water out or the oil or the gas. We also have a problem with sea level rise. Sea level has been coming up over the last century and we didn't start seeing large amounts of fossil fuels being burned till the mid-1920s, right here. And it's hard to see that in the curve unless you realize that that curve may not be quite as steep without it. It may come out somewhere like this. But definitely in the last hundred years, we've had a foot of sea level rise. Now I fought and fought and fought with a Corps of Engineers about this because they were doing, they were designing all the new structures for 75 year life and they were ignoring sea level rise. And I kept raising my hand saying, you got to design for sea level rise. And they gave me the lawyer answer. Which I'm sure it came from the lawyer. It didn't come from their scientists because their scientists aren't, you know, are, are, are pretty sharp. They're not that, that dumb. But they would give me the lawyer answer, which was, well, you know, the environmentalists, you know, some say one foot, some say two foot, some say three feet which there are some that say three feet. I don't know what that's based on. I don't think it's based on science, but there's some that say three feet. So you guys don't know, so we're just going to ignore it. I said, no, no, the basement's one foot because that's what we had the last hundred years. And if you even believe 1% in global warming, we're going to have at least 12 inches in the next uh, 100 years. And anyway, I kept um, losing that battle until there was an article in the Washington Post <laughs> And then everything changed. And that was what the article was about, saying, hey, you know, why isn't the Corps of Engineers looking at this? This seems pretty rational, this point that uh, Rogers and other engineers are, are bringing up. So sometimes you just want to stick to your guns and realize you want to go on record as saying what you know is right, but don't get inflammatory about it. Just state it as though it's a matter of fact. Okay, I guess I'm done. <laughs> We'll uh, stop there.